Bula and welcome to The Lens at 177. On this show we are speaking to the Minister of Home Affairs and Immigration, uh, someone who is very uh, familiar to us all, uh, someone who has uh, played a role in uh, a very powerful role in government and uh, you know we are so privileged to have you on the show with us. Thank you. Uh, thank you for joining us on the show. I want to ask you first, just uh, you know, uh, nine months into government, uh, what's the what's the journey been like? It wasn't easy at the beginning, right. but I am glad that uh, we have been able to build confidence, particularly with our security forces. Right. And um, I have been public about it. Yes. Uh, Bula and welcome back to The Lens at 177. We are having an interesting discussion with the Minister for Home Affairs and Immigration, Pio Tikundundua. Uh, Minister, the Fiji Police Force, I'll come back again to the police. Uh, about 26% of the force is uh, female. Uh, there was some commitment made uh, by the previous administration to increase it. But uh, we haven't really seen the, the kind of numbers that uh, we would like to see, uh, you know, with more women engaged in the force. And uh, considering a lot of the crimes that we deal with are domestic violence related and child sex abuse and sex abuse. So uh, is there any plan to increase this, this number? Yeah. Uh, <coughs> the Fiji Police Force is, a, is an equal opportunity Right. Uh, employment and right. uphold the rule of law. Right. Uh, you know, you mentioned uh, the rumors of coups and uh, and things of that nature. That doesn't seem to be going away. Uh, you know, we get letters that keep popping up on social media. Then it uh, fans the flames, and people go off on a tangent. And it's good to hear that uh, you know that the nation is secure. Um, but you know how how do we address this issue of people just coming up with it willy nilly, with uh, you know they saying the government is fall not following the constitution, uh, calling on the commander to step in. How how do we uh, address that? The um, unfortunately, those um, those information that we have been you know receiving. Uh, uh -huh. You know, on the subject you mentioned, yes, has been used by people on you know social media platforms. Right, people who don't answer to anybody, faceless. Right, yeah, and uh, it is difficult to um, to dialogue with anyone right. who's faceless and and uh, people who who advocate for these things. Huh? Right, yeah. Um, except to say that uh, we as government are talking yes. to the people. Right. We are talking to the agencies that matter. Mm -hmm. And in this case, you know, particularly to the RFMF. Right. And I want to assure the people that there is no cause for concern. Right. These things is not going to stop. Okay. It is not going to stop. And uh, because um, our laws are quite inadequate in many ways in dealing, you know, with um, information as such. Right. So we have to try and deal with it mm -hmm. amongst all the other, you know, responsibilities that government has to undertake. And for my part, yes, is to try and you know maintain law and order. Right. Uh, despite the fact that these these messages are floating around, and you know, it, it cannot, no one can be held accountable to that right. for that. Right. And uh, because it is, is essentially, it is propaganda. Yes. Yeah. Right. I've said many times <laughs> that uh, we have the third arm of the state, which is the judiciary. Yes. Which is where we should take our grievances if we, you know, if you have any, uh, if you have an issue right. against the law not being followed or the constitution for that matter. Right. You take it there. You don't go inciting the RFMF to do something illegal. Right. Yeah. So that continues to be our position. Yes. You know, um, 
I'm glad, you know, whatever had come up has faded away, but I suspect this is not going to be the last time that yes. we will be here. Yes. But the people have to be assured. Yes. Uh, I want to assure the Fijian public right. that, uh, you know, our agencies that are looking after, you know, upholding law and order, right. including the RFMF and the police, understand their role. Right. And um, they are there uh, to make sure that everyone in Fiji is safe. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And there is nothing to fear. You know, uh, you speak about the role of RFMF and police. The previous government removed weapons that the police force had for um, certain uh, situations or emergencies. Is there, are they going to be rearmed, uh, the, the particular unit? Will it be rearmed again or will you just maintain arms only with RFMF? At, at the moment we have not rearmed them. Right. But uh, obviously, you know, under the law and their role, that they are also, um, uh, you know, the law allows for them to be, to carry firearms. Yes. Okay. But now it is something that we have to tread on, you know, maturely. Right. Yeah. Uh, we have, um, we're trying to harness police capability through other means. Uh, okay. Police carry arms, you know, during ceremonials, and that's about all when they do carry them. Right. But to state the law specifically, yes. the you know the the police, particularly the the PSRU. Yes. You know, um, uh, are allowed to have their own, you know, armory. Yes. And have weapons of their own. Uh, to be used, obviously, you know, on a need to basis, which I don't think has been used in Fiji for quite a while. Yes, yes. Uh, while we're talking about guns, um, I'm going to speak about this because it's on um, out there in social media. You did mention that uh, to a group of farmers in Rakiraki, that uh, you know the possibility of them carrying, uh, having uh, rifles because of the stray animal issue. Yes. If you could just you know, maybe just elucidate a bit on the context you, in which you said it. Yes, I mean, there was a big complaint in the Greek about stray animals. Right. Yeah. I understand that uh, you just don't go shooting any stray animals because the current law, right. uh, as it were, I'm not sure how practical it is. Right. So if there is a stray animal that comes into your farm, you have to you have to capture the animal and then right. take it to an impounding area right. for the Ministry of Agriculture. Right. Yeah. But, you know, if these animals, you know, be they are domesticated or wild, right. also do not only do they pose a threat to the farms, but right. they also pose a threat to the farmers' lives. Right. Yeah. The law allows for farmers mm. to carry firearms, weapons. Right a certain um, a caliber of weapon, so I believe it's 0 .22, 0 .22 yes. and uh, um, what's the other one? 12 gauge, right. you know the one where they shoot the sonke. Yes. Okay. So I thought those things might become useful because it has really become a problem for them. Right. Yeah. But obviously the laws have to be fixed in how they handle um, you know, stray animals that yeah. belong to others. Right. But animals that belong to them, yeah. uh, uh, in the past the law allow, allows for the farmers to, you know, to put down yes. animals that are wild or need to be put down, right. which allows them to keep these arms with them. Um, I, I believe some of these arms are still with the RFMF at this stage. Yes. But there's a reason, you know, for them, for the farmers to hold these in their armory. Right. Obviously subjected to the laws that guide the proper storage and also the use of it. Right. Yeah, you know, some uh, women's groups, uh, you know, they've, they've actually said uh, this could lead to some farmers getting frustrated with their wives and shooting them or uh, using the weapons on them. You know, it's it's an extreme example. Mm -hmm. But uh, just the concerns about the security and the, how the arms are kept, 
uh, and all that, and whether the farmers will be assessed before being allowed to... At the buy. moment, uh, I believe, you know, what is the practice now that the arms are kept right. with the, um, the RFMF Amri, right. and I think that's been there for quite a while. Okay. And some farmers who desperately need them, you know? Yes. Um, uh, there are these uh, farmers I know in Tebuni and right. other places where the, you know, the cattle stock is attacked by, yes. by dogs, right. you know, wild dogs, yes. and they have no means to be able to protect their own stock. And right. So this is why it has always been that farmers do carry weapon. Right. What's you know, the, I, I recognize the concerns mm -hmm. because there is, like, you know, in most places, there's, there's subject to people abusing. Right. Yeah. yeah. I recognize the concerns there. Mm -hmm. But I'm just talking about the law. Right. And the law has been there. People had this, yes. um, you know, assault is an offense under the Crimes Act. Yes. But the level of domestic violence, you know, <laughs> husbands, are yes. uh, you know, doing, you know, physical harm to their wife continues yes. on a daily basis. Yeah. So um, I can understand their concerns. Obviously, that is something we need to consider mm. if we have to rearm the farmers. Right. Okay, solely for the purpose of looking after their livestock and their family. Right. Keep watching, we'll be right back after a short break. We were around when the deed was first signed. We were around when the first car engine roared. We were around when the very first was crowned. Through devastations, jubilant celebrations, and the milestones. We will continue to be around to bring you all the stories first. Bula and welcome back to the lands at 177. I'm here with the uh, Minister for Home Affairs and Immigration, Pio Tikundundu, and we're discussing um, issues of uh, uh, national issues. Uh, we were just talking about um, farmers and their uh, stray animal issue. And, uh, Minister, I'm just going to speak uh, or move on to uh, police. Uh, you know, there have been a growing number of police officers involved in uh, uh, sexual crimes, according to uh, ODPP statistics. Uh, we've had officers in the, in the media that have uh, been highlighted in the media. Just the fact that, uh, you know, we have people who the community look up to, to uphold the law, uh, who are now also breaking it. Uh, you know, just, just uh, cons are you concerned that uh, this continues to be an issue? I am concerned. I am very concerned about the gravity of mm. these uh, allegations in places. Right. Uh, there have been police uh, men, in, particularly policemen, that have been charged right. uh, with these offences. Obviously, that's with the ODPP have come up with uh, these statistics about police involvement, right. and essentially, what it is is a misplace of trust. Right. Yeah. You trust the police to look after people. Mm. Uh, in every way, yes, and uh, um, <clears throat> and there is no justification whatsoever. Right. Yeah. The uh, you know the onus of the responsibility is greater for them than the ordinary citizen because they're supposed to be there to uphold the law. That's right. Uh, so when a police man or police woman, for that matter. Mm -hmm you know, uh, is alleged or has been put through the system for committing, you know, any crime for that matter, yes. including sexual, sexually related crimes, right. it becomes a great area of concern. Yes. Yeah. I, um, uh, it's interesting to find out what the, you know, what the motivation is, but yes. I mean, it's outright wrong. Yes. So, when a policeman, just like anyone, 
you know, members of the public. Right. If they commit offenses, you know, sexual in nature, right. then the public must report it. Yes. So that, you know, the law takes its course in terms of investigation and, if, you know, further on, right. what other actions need to be taken. Right. Yeah. But uh, this is something that we continually impress upon the police because, mm -hmm. you know, with power comes responsibility. Yes. And unfortunately, some abuse this authority and use it for their own, you know, personal, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, what can you say, um, you know, for their own personal motivations. Yeah. yeah. You know, the, the reason I ask the question is, um, uh, the Fiji Women's Crisis Centre coordinator, uh, Shamima Ali, is, is a very outspoken person when it comes to women's and girls' rights. And uh, in, in an interview that she had here with us, she said one of her biggest challenges is the police. Uh, so when policemen commit these crimes, or when uh, victims of domestic violence or uh, sexual abuse go to the station, they are uh, sometimes a bit hesitant to go there, not knowing what kind of reception they'll get at the station. And uh, also, uh, you know, there's concerns that uh, the police officers themselves don't know how to handle uh, victims when they turn up. So, you know, just your... Yeah, uh, I, I sympathize with her and I can understand where she's coming from. Right. Um, Particularly, you know, the, the notion that the police are supposed to uphold the law. Yes. And an allegation here is being put against the policemen or women, right. you know, for such an offence. So, sexual offences are no drop policy. When they come, yes, the police should, they're not allowed to try and negotiate, you know, anything. Right. They have to be put through. Yes. There's a procedure, like everyone else. Right. But, um, if the members of the public mm -hmm. feel, you know, that, uh, um, that they find it difficult to report the matter, right. then there are other avenues that they could follow. Yes. Yeah. Uh, one, obviously, is to the Women's Crisis Centre and mm -hmm. other, you know, women, because most of the victims are women. Eh? Yes. Yeah. Um, but also, we have the ministry that is available there right. in terms of the social welfare. Okay. Ministry for Women and Children. Right. Those are places where they can take their complaint if they feel that they cannot go straight to the police to report on a police that has committed, you know, uh, well, you know, and if they want to make an, an allegation, a report right. about a police that is alleged to have committed a sexual offence. Right. And then we can take it from there. Okay. Um, we've seen uh, a few incidents of uh, policemen behaving badly. Uh, you know, there was a case with a bus driver where the policeman assaulted him and uh, uh, Ms. Lenora Gergetabo was a witness in that case. Uh, we've had other cases where the public uh, are not handled in the way they should be yeah. by uh, police officers. So is there maybe an issue in terms of training or uh, what is it? Is it training or lack of training in competency maybe? Yeah. Or is it a mindset issue? What, what could it be? It's a combination of many things. Right. I, you know, at the beginning I was, when I assumed this role. Yes. So I'd been visiting police stations everywhere visiting the police. Right. So I impress upon them mm. that um, that to uphold the law, one must follow the law first. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They cannot, they cannot misuse their powers right. as police officers to do what they just want to do that is not allowable in law. Right. Um, as I said, the, this could mean many things, and like for a long time, you know. Right. Um, perhaps the attitude has strayed a bit. Yes. And um, I've been, uh, we have commissioned a study, right. you know, a review of the Fiji police force under the theme of Restore Blue. Right. Salus Populi, yeah? right. and we have a former officer that is doing this job, uh, you know, under the auspices of the United Nations, you know, with the assistance of my ministry. The whole idea mm -hmm. is just to try and get the police back on track. Right. Yeah. 
There have been many, many cases in the past of leadership and all that that has contributed to this in nothing. Yes. But, but in terms of sexual offences, as you would know, this is a bit of a power thing. Right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. The attitude is bad. Yes. Yeah. But as I said, there is only one way to treat it after, it, you know, if it's being committed, mm -hmm. and that is to report it. Right. You know, is it through the police station or through those other places that I've mentioned earlier? Yes. But um, this is one area that they continue to uh, impress upon, you know, new recruits and the police in their training internally within their own divisions. Right. Okay, to, is to eradicate. Yes. You know, mm -hmm. the committal of sexual offences or any other offence for that matter. Right. Yeah. They give the police a real, really bad name, and uh, there's more than we have more than enough troubles to deal with than worrying about the police, right. you know, committing or unless they have committed the offences themselves, including ones that are sexual in nature. Right. So, but there is to be a zero tolerance. The force has a zero tolerance for it. Right. I want to assure the public. Yes. So, if you have, you know, an issue about the police. Doing this, please do not. Mm. Okay, do not be reluctant. Do not be afraid. Do right. not be discouraged. Right. Okay, right. Um, these things must not be allowed to continue. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, moving on to the illicit drug trade. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, with uh, anecdotal evidence, I think I've spoken to you about this before. Uh, we you speak to people out in communities; mm -hmm. they know who the drug uh, traders are, they know the locations, they know the people that are involved. Now they are involving children as drug mules, even uh, primary school children yeah. are used. So, you know, uh, I think the question a lot of people are asking is, why aren't we making a concerted effort to just shut them down, you know, completely and just try and... Uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> the thing, Felix, we are a rule-based society. Right. Yeah. Right. So um, you don't just, you just don't pick it up and then you go and then you take the law into your own hands. Right. The, the procedure is quite clear. Yes. If you know of someone right. that's dealing in this thing and you have the evidence, report it. Right. Report it. And if you, if you feel that it's, you can't take it to the police, then bring it to us. We can right. we help you, you know? Yes. Yeah. But drug is a, Drug is a national problem. It's not a police problem only. Right. The police can resolve it. I've said this from the beginning. Yes. So we are working, uh, you know, we are working with everyone concerned, you know, right. to see, to bring, to bear a national solution whereby we can mitigate this. Right. You know. Mm -hmm. So as long as bad people are out there, it will be difficult to completely eradicate it. Right. But it's to mitigate it and deal with it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll be right back after a short break. We were around when the deed was first signed. We were around when the first car engine roared. We were around when the very first was crowned. Through devastations, jubilant celebrations, and the milestones. We will continue to be around to bring you all the stories first. Bula and welcome back to The Lens at 177. We are having an interesting discussion with the Minister for Home Affairs and Immigration, Pio Tikunduandua. Uh, Minister, the Fiji Police Force, I'll come back again to the police. Uh, about 26% of the force is uh, female. Uh, there was some commitment made uh, by the previous administration to increase it. But uh, we haven't really seen the, the kind of numbers that uh, we would like to see, uh, you know, with more women engaged in the force. And uh, considering a lot of the crimes that we deal with are domestic violence related and child sex abuse and sex abuse. So uh, is there any plan to increase this, this number? Yeah. Uh, 
<coughs> the Fijian police force is a is an equal opportunity right. uh, employment um, workplace. Right. So um, women have equal rights to men yes. when they come in for interview. Okay. Obviously, the system is based on merit. Yes. A consideration is gender, which is something that government continues to try to do, mm -hmm. and that is to is to increase the participation of women. Right. Okay. Um, we have not gone uh, to the stage where we have quotas, you know. Okay. But this is something that the service needs to do to be able to, you know, continue to meet this strategic development goal. Right. Because that is one of the areas, like particularly Parliament, when they look at reports right. um, coming from, uh, you know, the various departments that they look after and ministry, you know, what is the level of participation for women? Yes. But this is something that we, uh, that we need to continue to develop. I agree with you in right. that regard to have more women in the Fiji police force. Yes. That is something that we continue to, you know, to, well, at least I, you know, continue to bring down to bear right. on the, you know, on the hierarchy of the police in terms of how they do the selections. But uh, by the same token, we do not want, you know, competent male, um, right. you know, candidates also, not to miss out purely because, mm -hmm. you know, we have to offer a slot to someone right. else. I mean, right. you know, this is supposed to be about equality, as I said earlier. Yes, mm. yes. Uh, I'm going to move into more of a broader security issue. Um, we had an incident in Walu Bay where someone tried to <coughs> sabotage the fuel tanks that are there. How are we monitoring <coughs> people entering and leaving the country with the potential of terrorism, you know, in uh, Fiji? Is uh, do we have a special uh, unit that looks at that, or who who actually polices the borders? Yeah, terrorism is a real problem. Right. It's a it's a problem worldwide. Yes. We are susceptible to it. Mm -hmm. There is always a level of extremism. Yes. You know? uh, in every country, people who are members of issue-motivated groups and who resort to, right. uh, you know, violence yes. uh, to achieve their goals, irrespective of what they may be right. you know, and what is the motivation for it. In future, within the police, mm -hmm. uh, we have dedicated resources that look right. after that. We rely uh, on our intelligence system to tell us because you know, the government's uh, intelligence agencies, they're also looking at this as part of the areas that they're looking at yeah. from wherever this could, you know, this could evolve from. Yes. So, I mean, you know, without mentioning names of organizations or whatnot, but um, yes, we do. We do have a dedicated uh, uh, people, particularly it's in information intelligence gathering. Right. Yeah. So when we do get, you know, adequate information that you know suggests a particular uh, you know certain evidence in place yes. that's when we react to it so that's that's when we deploy people to counter it eh? right. Yeah. right so um, that we will continue to do mm -hmm. but uh, you know we implore the public you know to be on the watch yes look out for things that are Maybe unfamiliar, right. you know, unusual yes. in many places, yes. particularly in our, um, um, you know, critical, critical services. You know, yes. this is where the biggest threat lies. Yes. So um, I would urge everyone, right. if you know, you know, uh, of some information that uh, points towards, you know, terrorist uh, activities into the future, right. similarly to what has, you know, happened on the Envolvay, please, yes. you know, come to the police and tell them. Right. You know, uh, the, uh, the, there could be an argument that we have existing systems to monitor terrorists and terrorism activity, etc. But what if it involves uh, police themselves? You know, the uh, uh, U.S. has the FBI mm. uh, that does do uh, work investigating in the, within the U.S. Mm. Would we maybe in the future or in the near future look at a similar sort of setup that's removed from the police, an organization purely dedicated to that? 
It is, uh, I mean, for the moment, um, in terms of investigation, that is the work of the police. Right. You know, they investigate uh, uh, people who, you know, who have been alleged to have, you know, committed right. offenses related to drugs. Yes. So um, that is really the only avenue that we have. But mm. if people believe or they know have evidence of the police right. indulging in such activity yes yeah they should come up to the authorities to tell us you know right i know this guy and they have to point specifically right you know it's not good enough just you know using a broad brush of paint to right. say that you know people many people do say that yes but we also have to you know give the benefit of the doubt to people right but we depend on complainants yes you know to tell us what these are right. or who it is that's doing this you know right. before we can act on it yes um the police has a um a special department that deals with, I think it's internal division matter, yeah. looking after police discipline. Right. But that's more internal. Yes. But if police are involved in drugs and whatever else, yes. and they get reported and right. there is evidence and that goes through the criminal process, obviously there is a procedure to follow right. with the police in that regard. Okay. Um, one issue that's being talked about quite often is the Grace Road issue. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, when the coalition government came in, there was a task force set up, and from then until today, we have not had an update. No one knows uh, what's going on with Grace Road. Are they going to continue to be allowed to acquire property, uh, bring in more Korean nationals into Fiji? What is the status of the current uh, Koreans that are here? Are they still considered legally legal here? Or, you know, nobody seems to know anything. And uh, I'm just going to put that question to you. What, what is the <coughs> situation there? Well, Grace Road is a bit of a funny issue. Right. Because this is something we have inherited from the last government. Right. Uh, in, all, in all the concerns that come with it. Yes. Obviously, the, the economic model, the registration of the companies in terms of the shareholding. Right. Uh, is... Uh, <coughs> It's questionable in many places. Yes. There is a task force that is under my ministry that is investigating it. Right. Uh, we, um, <clears throat> I had said earlier in an interview that uh, from cabinet in terms of government, right. the Deputy Prime Minister Kamakamitha is heading that, uh, yes. that charge for government. Obviously, it is there because there is concern. Right. Yeah, in terms of the information we have received and the background of the people that are there. Right. Um, we hope uh, very soon that we will be able to conclude some of these investigations on what we are, on the leads that we are following. Right. So I do not want to share too much information at this stage, right. but uh, hopefully that is something that we will be able to act decisively given, you know, to act decisively on, given, you know, um, uh, the peculiarities yes. of what Grace Road is about, yeah. right. uh, without compromising the investigation, so to speak. Yeah. Right. You know, a, a lot of people are also asking about the children of those uh, Grace Road, uh, the Korean community. Uh, you know, if they are born here, do they naturally become Fijian? No, they don't. Okay. Short answer. Very good, thank you, sir. Uh, just moving. There is a procedure to follow. Right. Yeah, but uh, they don't automatically become Fijians. Okay. Mm. So they remain nationals of uh, Korea uh, under that. Uh... Yes, if the parents did come from Korea and carry oh. Korean passports. Right. I don't know what the Korean laws are right. about children that are born abroad. Yes. You know to employees, shareholders of uh, Grace Road, right. but that is something that needs to be dealt with under Korean law. Right. But as far as our national laws are concerned, there is no automatic citizenship. Okay. Mm. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, again, in uh, immigration, do we have an issue with uh, people of other nationalities that are here illegally, and how are we addressing that? Well, I say in the list seems to become bigger and bigger every week. 
people who are declared prohibited immigrants who overstay. Right. Okay. So there is a process that they have to follow mm. to appeal, you know, so that they do not get deported. Right. Otherwise, if they do not meet the requirement, then immigration tells them to go out yes. and then they can reapply right. for a permit, you know, yes. to come back to Fiji, irrespective of what, on, on what grounds, be it commercial, business, education and whatnot. Right. There has been concerns about the number of passports that were issued in the past. Yes. Yeah. This is something that, uh, you know, our people have numbers to that. And as far as I'm concerned, a lot of those have met their requirements, you know, before the laws change, which is, you know, five years right. at the time. Now it is 15 years and you have to be here 10 years con consecutively, you know. Right. So uh, an influx of uh, certain nationalities. Yes. Yeah. Um, we haven't gone about to try and investigate how they got their citizenship. Obviously, there's a whole lot of other things to do. Right. But those are things that we keep on the back of our minds to, you know, to make sure that um, uh, that people, when they got their citizenship, have complied with, uh, you know, with the laws of the country before they got um, uh, their citizenship. Right. Otherwise, other than that, there is a lot of rumor mongering, you know. Yes. So it goes back to that thing. If anyone mm -hmm. believes or knows of someone with evidence that yes. someone is an illegal and has obtained their passport other than by legal means, right. and the police to have them report them to the police or to immigration officials. Yeah. And, uh, are, are there any security concerns with those nationals who are not not legally? Are supposed to be here. Well, at the moment, there is no reason to suggest. Right. Yeah, but there are citizens of certain countries. Yes. You know um, that have been renowned for terrorist. Uh, right. You know uh, activities. Uh, countries. You know known sponsors of terrorism in the world. Right. And uh, who are here that have been granted citizenship? From my records, you know, and I've checked. You know, almost all of them have acquired their passports after being here, almost all, you know, for the proper time. Right. <coughs> but whether other due considerations were taken before they were granted, yes. you know, that takes time, you know, uh, to be investigated. If right. people know reasons, yes. as I said earlier, suggesting that someone has acquired their passport other than, other than the lawful means, then please do come along. Right. Yeah. Okay. Otherwise, you know, you don't want to run, you know, it'd be a bit of a goose chase, you know, right. trying to s just to find out whether, you know, you are yeah. compliant and all that. Right. Yeah. Mm. Right. Okay. Well, unfortunately, we've uh, come to the end of our show, but I want to thank you, Minister, for Look. agreeing to appear on the show with us. And no worries. I hope to see you again in the future. Well, all you have to do is pick up the phone and invite me. I will do that. Okay. Thank you, Mr. All right. Thank you, Felix. Thank you, and uh, thank you for watching The Lens at 177. Please visit our website, www.fijitimes.com, and our social media platforms to watch this show and uh, to read all about it in the Fiji Times as well. Thank you.